Hello, KRTS listeners. Thanks so much for listening to Marfa Public Radio, located independently at 93.5 on your FM dial. This is the Talk at 10 interview show where today, as mentioned twice now, we'll speak (laughs) with Lon Taylor. And Lon is a local historian, uh, Texas historian. He's a radio personality at none other than KRTS in West Texas. Uh, He's a newspaper writer with his weekly Ramblin' Boy column, which will be a book in, Lon, how long will that be? Uh, It'll be out in February of next year. It'll be called Texas, My Texas, and is published by Texas Christian University Press. And you got another book coming down the pipe, which is? That's right. That uh, is a second edition of a book that uh, David Warren and I did in 1975, And it is called Texas Furniture, a very imaginative title. It's a (laughs) book about 19th century Texas furniture. Well, I hope to tap into both of those in our 29 remaining minutes. But I want to let people know the last line of my introduction is, and I can vouch for this, that Lon Taylor is an all-around nice guy, and exceptionally so. And uh, maybe if we have time uh, at the end of the interview, you can give me some hints or lessons on how to pull that off myself. But as for now, thanks for being here, and uh, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Jason Kolker, sometimes known by my nickname Oslo, and I want to start by telling you, Lon, and the listeners about how I came about asking you for this interview. Uh, The first part comes from a talk I had with Tim Johnson, the bookstore owner, about the the Bright Raid, which we'll get to in just a second. And Tim said, you know who knows about this stuff is, is Lon Taylor. And I thought to myself... Lon Taylor, he's the guy who does these rotators, these little messages saying this is KRTS. And I've been at the station for two years. I'd been hearing your voice for two years and seeing the name on the screen here, and I'd never saw you. And so I thought to myself, wait a minute, is that guy alive? I didn't know you were a real person. (laughs) And that that rang a bell for me because the second part was, I I don't know if this (laughs) this is something you notice about yourself, but to the outside world, your voice is so kind of iconic. It's so much uh, what a Texas voice should be that I thought uh, I'd like to open up just by asking you, where is your accent from or what movies do you see or, you know, what, what can I do to get an accent like that? Well, I, uh, I think maybe you have to have been born in 1940, Jason. That may be beyond your capabilities. Is, is it too late? Okay. Uh, it, may, it may be too late. Uh, and where did you grow up? Uh, well, I sp- actually spent most of my childhood in the Philippine Islands, uh, although I do not have a Filipino accent. Uh, <laughs> for, I, I claim uh, Fort Worth as my hometown. Right. Uh, speaking of which, we had the big fires there. How did you do with those? Uh, well, we uh, actually, my wife and I were not in Fort Davis when the fire broke out. We were uh, traveling back from New Mexico. Uh-huh. And we were stopped in Balmeray until we couldn't go home because the whole town was on fire. And uh, we spent the night in the motel in Balmeray, not knowing whether we would have a home to come home to or not. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the next morning we discovered our house and our neighborhood were intact. So you, your house is okay? Yes. Now, th- I know that you sound like you live in a log cabin, but I had heard from a source uh, that your home was actually architected by a local architect. Is- well, that's right. When uh, we uh, we retired to Fort Davis in 2002 uh, from Washington, D.C., where my wife and I were both working, and we bought some town lots there, and our house was designed by Marvin Watson, uh, who has been an architect in Fort Davis for 25 years. Well, let's, uh, we'll get to the history, but since we're on this, uh, this road of talking about you and uh, how you ended up here in Fort Davis or Marfa Public Radio, how did you end up getting on the radio here? And you do, let's just tell folks, you have this Ramblin' Boy column, right? But you actually read it as well. On the well, that, that's right. I started writing that Ramblin' Boy column uh, a little more than seven years ago uh, for Kay Burnett's newspaper over in Alpine, the Desert Mountain Times. Huh. And when the Desert Mountain Times closed down, I uh, I moved over to the Marfa Big Ben Sentinel. And when Tom Michael began talking about opening a radio station here and looking for local programming, uh, I, I think I went to him and said, uh, gee, I've always wanted to be on the radio. 
uh, could I do a program that would involve uh, reading my, my column? And he said, sure. And it, so that's how it came about. And you had never been on the air or performed or done anything like that before? Oh, not really. No, I've, I've been a fairly uh, solitary <laughs> academic uh, type. Most well, of I, I know. Life. Wait, wait, wait. I know for a fact that that's not true. Uh, you, you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you read your Ramblin' Boy columns, one thing you learn is that Lon Taylor has done about everything that you can do in a life. Uh, including there was politics for a little bit. When was, uh, I think, what, you said after you dropped out of NYU, somehow you, well, just do it for me. Well, I'm, a, I'm <laughs> one of those guys that, uh, that dropped out of graduate school in the 1960s. And that was graduate school and, for what? And uh, I was in graduate school in, in uh, political science mm-hmm. at New York University. And uh, I came back to Texas the, the summer after my first year, to actually take a crash course in German at the University of Texas. And uh, I got involved with a bunch of people who were interested in uh, democratic politics uh, in Austin in the summer of 1962, and I started working for politicians. And uh, I decided it, it was more fun to actually do politics than study politics. And uh, I did that for, uh, for several years in Austin. Let me go back a second. So you left NYU to study German in Texas, and w- which I'm sure there are people who speak German in New York, but for whatever reason you came out here. Does that have any connection with the fact that Texas has a German heritage? Well, no, I don't think so. The, the University of Texas at, at that time, if you were working on a Ph.D. Uh, in the 1960s, you had to pass a test in German, uh, no, I think no matter what your field was. And uh, that was kind of a holdover from the days when German universities dominated the academic world. And the University of Texas had developed a crash course uh, in German that people from all over the country who were uh, prospective Ph.D. candidates came down to Austin and took. And that's, that's that's why I went to Austin to take it. And your political career ended in some uh, high office, or how did that? Come oh, out? absolutely not. I, <laughs> I was a, I was essentially a gopher uh, for any number of, mm. of state senators, and I worked for a while for U.S. Senator Ralph Yarbrough. But uh, I eventually got uh, burned out on. Uh, Frankly, I got burned out on being nice to people that I knew were not nice people right. uh, at heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found, uh, fortunately, I had very indulgent parents, and uh, they were willing to put up with me sort of casting around trying to figure out what I was going to do uh, until I was in my late 20s. And uh, I then I tried to make a living for a while as a freelance writer, and that didn't go very far. <laughs> uh, and I finally got a job with a World's Fair yeah. Uh, in San Antonio, the Hemisphere, 1968. And I discovered that I had a real talent for conceiving and writing exhibit scripts. And that uh, sort of propelled me into the museum world. And that's uh, what I've done the rest of my adult life. Do you, do you think all these things, you just mentioned th- three things, the um, politics, the freelance writing, uh, the museum work, all kind of contribute to someone becoming a historian because they're all tangentially connected to the writing and the research and the well I shouldn't say the politicizing but the investigation of nuance in politics that make a historian uh, what a historian is well I've always been interested in in history uh, ever since I was a little kid uh-huh. my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up and she was born in 1877 and on a cotton farm in Texas. Her father had been in the Confederate Army, and she talked to me a lot about her childhood and her father, and I think that uh, got me interested in in the past. Okay, so we've kind of walked up the Lon Taylor ladder to uh, where he's a historian, and so let's, with a nod to Tim Johnson, tell us what the Bright Raid was, or and also not just what it was, but uh, if it's been overlooked. Well, the Bright Ranch Raid. Uh, the Bright Ranch Raid was actually one of a series of uh, raids across the Mexican border that took place in the Big Bend between uh, 1916 and 1919. 
the Mexican Revolution was going on in Mexico, and uh, the uh, the various revolutionary parties uh, essentially developed a system of stealing cattle and reselling the cattle to big men ranchers and using the money to buy guns and ammunition with from big men storekeepers. Now, this was an organized thing, or was this just uh, renegades? Well, it, it was uh, it was both organized and renegade. There were basically two uh, political factions fighting each other in northern Mexico, the, the followers of Venustiano Carranza and the followers of Pancho Villa. But there were also a lot of freelance gangs that took advantage of the disorder Mm -hmm. to simply loot and rob and steal. And uh, so the Bright Ranch Raid uh, specifically uh, took place on Christmas Day 1917. And about uh, 40 or or 50 uh, armed Mexicans came across the border and they knew that, that very few people would be at the ranch on Christmas Day. And in fact, the Bright family themselves were here in Marfa. They had, they had a, a home here. Which as, is still up there, right? As well at the ranch, huh? Yeah. That, that big, uh, the big, Bright uh, Mansion is what the Bright people Mansion. call it, yeah. Right. And, uh, the only person at the ranch was the uh, ranch manager and his family. He was a guy named Van McNeil. And uh, the raiders struck the ranch at almost dawn on Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they uh, essentially were after the store goods in the store. There was a little general store there. And uh, they uh, pinned the, the ranch manager and his family up in the house uh, with gunfire and then went to the store and started looting the store. And in the middle of all this, the uh, mail hack drove up, uh, driven by a guy named Jimmy Welch. That was back when they still delivered the mail on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. And he had a couple of passengers, and the raiders killed him. They cut his throat and killed the two passengers. And uh, then people began arriving at the ranch for Christmas dinner. The Disciples of Christ preacher from Marfa showed up. And uh, the raiders let him uh, go on in the in the house, and another neighbor came up and saw what was going on. Let me let me slow. You. I've, yeah. I've got a few questions built up. First yeah. of all, um, if you're young or an exceptionally newcomer to this area, crossing the border with forty guys in you know the early 1900s was not nearly. It, it was not an enforced border as it is now. Oh, no, and there there are thousands of places down there, as you know today, where people still... Could still do it, go right. Go back and forth. Uh, and then the, the, the murders, the throat cutting and stuff, why was that done? Why didn't these guys just try to run away? Or well, ev- evidently, they uh, they tried... When, when Mickey Welsh drove up to the ranch, he didn't realize what was going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, these fellows came out of the store and tried to take his mules I see. away out out of his hack, and he vociferously objected, mm-hmm. and so they grabbed him and cut his throat. And this happened where? I mean, where where did the murders take place? It, it was at the Bright Ranch, which is. But the uh, Bright Ranch is huge. Where? Well, where? It, no, it was at the Bright Ranch headquarters, which is which is uh, south. Uh, West of here, about uh, 20 miles. Okay, so 20 miles from KRTS Studios, you had this uh, basically a historical set of murders, which led to what? Oh, my. It, it led to uh, a reprisal uh-huh. uh, in which uh, a company of Texas Rangers and a group of citizens uh, surrounded the uh, little town of Porvenir. Uh, which is on the Texas side of the river, or was. It's not there anymore. And uh, they executed uh, 15 innocent people. They, they marched them <laughs> M- in. Mis- mistakenly? Or no, as not just mistakenly. Retribution, just thinking, as retribution. Thinking they, that one Mexican equals another Mexican? Well, they they thought that some of the people who lived at Porvenir had participated in the raid. So then but, it was mistaken. But they had they had no evidence. Right. Uh and uh, there, that was the beginning of a lot of animosity between uh, Hispanic people and Anglo people and the big men. 
You say that was the beginning of a lot of animosity, or was that just part of a long, long history of a lot of animosity? No, I think I think the border raids were really the the beginning of uh, mm-hmm. of animosity. I think the two groups got along together pretty well before that. Okay, well, I don't know about this. Uh, most people. I don't know. I'd say probably 99% of the people I've talked to uh, in Marfa, at least, don't know about this. Was this something that was uh, rather forgotten, intentionally forgotten, or I just don't read enough? Well, you know, things like that 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 are extremely disruptive uh, tend to not be talked about very much Mm -hmm. because people don't want to reopen those those old wounds. I'll, I'll tell you a brief story about this. I wrote a column about the the massacre uh, at Porvenir, and uh, I published that about five years ago. And I got a phone call uh, one night from a very old man in Uvalde mm-hmm. who told me that he had witnessed that massacre. His father had been killed in it. He was a very small boy. And he ended the phone call by saying, uh, you said you thought there should be a historical marker there with the names of the murdered men on it. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, some of us think there ought to be a sign there with the names of the murderers on it. Hmm. And I thought, wow, you yeah. know, that was a long time ago. And it's it's still divisive, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, we. Uh, I'm just looking at the clock here, and there's never enough time. But for this particular interview, I had four pages of stuff to ask you. Uh, but we'll talk re- fast. Re- yeah, real quick, though. So if this was the template for racial relations uh, for many, many years after that, what was the end of that template? Do you remember? I guess you weren't here in, in uh, West Texas, but you studied the area. Do you know about the ending of segregation here? I think it was 1965, according to what Cecilia Thompson told me. Well, I, I really don't know very much about that. You know, to me, segregation uh, means uh, segregation between African Americans and, and other folks. And yet, you wrote about the Garcia brothers. I, I've read that uh, from well, 1946 I, I, I did. or something. Well, I, I think the end of, of segregation between Mexican Americans and Anglo Americans in Texas really came about as a result of World War II. Because you you had a whole generation of young uh, Mexican Americans who'd seen the world and knew things didn't work that way in other places, and they came back from the war. Uh, they organized uh, groups uh, like the American GI Forum and uh, stood up for the rights they'd fought for during the war. And you, uh, you as a Southern guy, because I know you, you, you said the Philippines, but you spent, was the years before that in South Carolina? That's where well, you, I was actually born in, in South Carolina. Right. Uh, were you a witness to this, the, 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 all these various types of integration and breaking down of barriers? Well, I, I, I participated uh, in the United Farm Workers strike in Starr County, Texas, and 1965 and 66 as a huh. as a picket. <laughs> I have a theory about that. I'm going to make a theory about your life, okay? You tell me if this has ever crossed your mind. But we were talking earlier, and you said you grew up in the Philippines. And you, from, I don't know, uh, age 6 to 16 or 7 to 17, went, and this is from 1946 to 56, you went to an integrated school, making you probably one of the first Americans in history, the first handful of Americans in history to go to an integrated school. Well, of course, people who lived in the north uh, went to neighborhood schools. They went to neighborhood but, schools, but neighborhoods yeah. were well, divided I, by... You know. I, I actually went to an international school. It was right. a private school, and there were, we usually had 20 or 30 nationalities Yes, that's, that's my point. Do you think yeah. that that uh, colored or shaped your life? Oh, yes, I definitely think it did. It, it uh-huh. made me believe that... Uh, that uh, when you put different cultures together, you get a more interesting mix, for one thing, huh. and a broader world view. Right. Okay. I agree with you. I just I thought it was interesting that uh, out of all the people going to school in 1946, probably one you know tenth of one percent went to an integrated school, and you yourself did, and you were active in these struggles. Not that other people weren't, but I, I think there must be some type of uh, some type of echo of what you were doing in school when you got to be older. I have some very disparate questions here, and I just want to jump. It'll be like a strong gear shift. 
uh, <laughs> we'll talk about your DeSoto later, but uh, <laughs> the, the Marfa lights. It's a very taboo subject here, Donald Judd and the Marfa lights. But uh, this is the Marfa lights. Do you have any experience with them? Well, I've never seen the Marfa lights. I'm perfectly willing to believe they're there. I've, I've heard a very well, wait, sound. Wait, wait, wait. Why are you willing to believe they're there if you've never seen them? Well, are you willing I, to believe that we? You well, know? I know a lot of people who've seen them who are reliable witnesses, and I've heard a very sound scientific explanation of them. Well, which is and the only reason I've never seen them is because I don't like to stay up late. <laughs> Okay, well, I, you, you can stay up after dark, but what, what is the scientific explanation you've heard? I, I, I thought I was going to get the historical explanation, but what is the scientific Oh, no. Well, uh, that they are the result of a peculiar geological formation that emits a certain type of gas, and that that formation and that phenomena is also found in other desert environments mm -hmm. uh, all over the world. They're not unique to Marfa. Well, that that explains the refraction of the lights. We'll uh, we'll leave the the source of the lights for the the mystery of the future. Here's another one. Someone asked me. Uh, in fact, all credit where credit is due. This is Jack of the Austin Street Cafe about the time zones. Why why is Texas either one not one time zone politically speaking? So every place you set foot in Texas is one time zone, or why is there not a straight line? Because we're west of Santa Fe, which is in a different time zone. Why, why don't we get um, an extra hour? Well, uh, let's back up a minute. Time zones were created by the railroads uh, because before the railroads were built, every town ran on its own time. And when the railroads came along, there had to be some sort of standard time to keep locomotives from running into each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then once created, they were jiggered around uh, by by local politics, and I uh, I am not sure uh, why El Paso is is in the Mountain Time Zone rather than the Central Time Zone, or or why the boundary runs as it does. But I'm sure there are political reasons for it. What is uh, 42? That's the Texas International <laughs> card game. They're official. Oh, 42. No, 42 is a domino game. Oh, it's a domino yeah, game. Yeah, 42 is a, is a game that you play so that you can gamble <laughs> on dominoes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's something like bridge played with dominoes in that you take tricks and, and the, some of the dominoes themselves have uh, value or, or count, as 42 players call it. And the total uh, number of of points in a hand totals up to forty two. But what does this have to do with with Texas? Well, I've always been told that the game was invented in Texas mm -hmm. uh, because uh, so many religious fundamentalists in Texas were opposed to playing cards. You know, cards are the devil's picture book. Right. Uh, but but dominoes just have spots on them. <laughs> and uh, I've also been told that uh, it was illegal in Texas for a long time to play cards on trains or in public places. Yeah. And so dominoes were a substitute for that. Let me tell you a little bit about yourself, and you tell me if I get any of this stuff right, okay? Uh, you were a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship winner. I was. And the... You want to tell? I'll I'll start off. You're already being modest. Woodrow Wilson Fellows. It's an educational kind of fellowship. It includes 13 Nobel laureates, 35 MacArthur Fellows, 11 Pulitzer Prize winners. Two, you know, I could go on and on. You're so, giving me an inferiority complex. Yeah, I'm, so. I was going to say you, you got you have a little time <laughs> left. You got to start working the harder. Grade there. But what, what, how'd you get that? What is that? Uh, well, it, it's a competitive fellowship that. Uh, was awarded primarily to people who uh, wanted to undertake to be college teachers, and uh, were you one? I uh, well, I was going to be until uh -huh. I dropped out of graduate school. Oh, I get you. And uh, Mrs. Lon Taylor is from Finland. Uh, no, her, she. My wife was born in Astoria, Oregon, mm -hmm. but her her father and her mother's parents were both from Finland, and Astoria has a very large Finnish population. Uh, Astoria is where exactly? Astoria is right at the mouth of the Columbia River. Does she speak um, the language? Because that's a she speaks a little Finnish. Yeah, that's yeah. a tough language. It is. You learned to drive on a fifty-five DeSoto. I did, and I'll tell you why. Was I, our family car. I bring this up for re this is this is just uh, 
this is about the most abstract type of <laughs> determination you could imagine. But the, do you remember the old DeSotos on the front of the car? They had a little icon of uh, Hernando de Soto. Yeah, right. And he was the first guy, or his people were the first Europeans to step into Texas. Well, that's not quite well correct. correct. But they you, you were can, very uh, early explorers. Oh, who, who was ahead of them? Uh, Cabeza de Vaca. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he got lost here. He he did. He yeah. got, he, he. I know. Okay. Sure, you can take that if you want. But Hernando sure. de Soto was the first one who came here to uh, pillage and get gold, which uh, is yeah. seemingly a continuous tradition among uh, politicians. Exactly. Around. Exactly. So we got. Do you, do you have anything you want to say? We have a, just about three minutes left. Um, I know you moved to Fort Davis because it was small and quiet. Has it lived up to your expectations? Oh, definitely it has, and and we have never looked back. Uh, we lived in downtown Washington D.C. Oh, uh, I did too. For I, yeah, we, you, yeah, we talked about exactly. That. Yeah. yeah. Well, we I lived there for nearly twenty years. My wife lived there for thirty-two years. We met in Washington, but uh, since we moved here, we have never looked back. We absolutely love living in the Big Bend. Yeah, I'm getting the same feel for that myself. But should we talk about our D.C. connection we discovered, which is. Uh, before I was born, my parents had moved to D.C., and they lived next door to the Rumsfelds, the Secretary of Defense, Donald <laughs> Rumsfeld. <laughs> That's right. In fact, even though my mom is very, very liberal, and obviously the Rumsfelds are not, they've been in touch with each other for some 45 years, like once every year, a couple times a year, they'll call to say hello. And what's your... Well, when, when Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense, mm-hmm. uh, he moved into a house about four doors down from the apartment building that we lived in. And uh, I, I used to see him occasionally carrying out the garbage cans uh, in the morning. And the, the only real change in the neighborhood was that we got uh, especially good security because he <laughs> had... Uh, he had several of these guys with uh, radios in their ears uh, standing around his front door all the time. Well, when my parents knew him, he wasn't getting any security. He wasn't <laughs> in government at that point. Uh, real quick, is Ambrose Pierce buried here in Marfa, Texas? And if so, where? Padres? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't think Ambrose Pierce is buried in Marfa. Uh-huh. But well, why, why would I even ask? Why would you ask? Because uh, Ambrose Pierce... Went to Mexico. Uh, Ambrose Beers being a famous writer. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he was an old man, he went to Mexico and disappeared. And uh, most people, I think, think that Pancho Villa had him shot. But uh, because uh, there was a refugee situation in 1915, uh, when a Mexican army at Ojinaga Uh, was defeated by Pancho Villa and that army and a bunch of refugees came across the river and uh, uh, marched to Marfa and were interned here. Uh, Someone has come up with a totally unsupported theory (laughs) that that Ambrose Bierce might have been among those refugees and might have died here. Right. You you, know, pigs might fly. You Uh, have have confidence in the existence of the Marfa lights, but Ambrose Bierce being buried in Marfa is just outrageous. Uh, that's that's <laughs> true. That's, that's my opinion. A little dead air there. Okay. Hey, take 30 seconds and tell us about your upcoming books, and then we'll say goodbye to everyone. All right. Uh, I've got a book called Texas, My Texas, uh, which is a group of rambling boy columns coming out from TCU Press uh, next spring, next February. And I've got uh, a book called Texas Furniture in two volumes. Uh, that will be out next year from the University of Texas Press. And I hope uh, all of our listeners will buy uh, all three books. Lon, I'm sorry. There's one thing I wanted to do. Uh, this is going to be a plug for you, not your books. Where is it? Someone gave me a quote about you that I just had to write down. Let's see. Looking through my notes here. Um, something about you being the nicest, least confrontational, sweetest man they know. And I'm, gonna. I'm not going to tell you who said that. But here, source says, one of the most non-argumentative, non-confrontational, sweet man I've ever met. How do I get to be like that? Any? Well, uh, be non-argumentative and non-confrontational. You're already sweet. Thank you very much. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> My name is Jason Kolker, sometimes called Oslo, Marfa Public Radio, KRTS 93.5 on your FM dial. 